S1 from Roland is a mighty little synth and the latest in their low-cost compact line. It's based on Roland's ACB digital modeling of their classic SH-101, but expands on the original with four voices, new oscillator wave shaping tools, parameter automation lanes in its 64-step sequencer, chorus delay and reverb effects, riser style performance effect, and a motion sensor. It's portable and has a built-in rechargeable battery and quite hands-on, but even more powerful if you're willing to dive into its menus and shift combos. In this video, I'll take a look at how it compares to Roland's other compacts in the series, its synth engine in detail, compare it to the SH-101, and take a look at its pros and cons overall. Before I start, a quick disclosure, Roland sent S1 over for review, no money changed hands, they have no say over the content of this video and don't get to see it before it's published. This channel is funded mainly by viewers who subscribe to exclusive content and book updates on Patreon, YouTube Premium and ads, and price check affiliate links in the description which help the channel regardless of the product you choose to buy. Okay, let's start with how S1 compares to the other compacts. It's exactly the same size and has the same connectivity build and screen as the T8 and J6, and the workflow is very similar. The knobs and buttons are small and close to each other, but still very usable. In terms of how it's different, the E4 does vocal and audio processing with a vocoder and harmony functions. T8 lets you play and sequence a few of Roland's classic drum sounds and has a 303 based acid style monophonic bass synth. And J6 is a four voice polyphonic synth based on the Juno 60, but with simplified synth engine controls and what makes it special are its chord banks and chord and arpeggiator style sequencing controls. The S1 is both monophonic and goes up to four voice polyphony with unison and chord modes, but what makes it different compared to the four voice J6, other than that the S1 is based on the SH-101 and this is on the Juno 60, is that the S1 has all the traditional detailed synthesis controls and sequencing features you'd expect from a synth, as opposed to being more of a preset synth with a built-in chord sequencer. Another difference is that the J6 more or less sticks to the Juno 60 sounds and model, whereas the S1 one goes way beyond not just in polyphony, but also with its draw and chop wave shaping features. So those are the main differences. I covered all the compacts in a previous video. I'll link to that below. Let's start with an overview of what we've got here. Things start out like a traditional SH-101 with an oscillator that can output four audio sources, saw noise, sub oscillator, and variable pulse width that's fed into a resonant low pass filter. Then on the modulation side, you've got an ADSR envelope and an LFO. Both have very simple mod destinations for the ADSR envelope. It's either level pulse width or the cutoff. And for the LFO, it's either oscillator frequency, filter frequency, or pulse width. Where things veer off from SH-101 territory is the sequencer and the draw and chop functions, which I'll go into in detail. The sequencer has probabilities and ratchets and up to eight modulation lanes for many of the on-panel and menu parameters. Sequences go up to 64 steps and you can store up to 64 patterns and presets on board. The S1 also has an arpeggiator with a few play modes, three master effects, delay, reverb, and a chorus. And it even has a demotion or motion sensor that detects movement both in roll and pitch, and these can be sent to a handful of destinations on the synth. In terms of workflow, it's similar to the other compacts. If you hold shift, you'll be able to access additional parameters, whether those that are labeled under these keys or on these keys. Many of the knobs also have secondary functions. So for example, this knob controls sub oscillator level, but with a shift controls comb level, which I promised to explain what that is, or this knob controls the LFO shape, but with shift controls whether it's in sync or not. And you'll sort of see three values, often numeric values on the right, and then a letter that gives you a hint at what this does. So this is comb, and this is sub oscillator level, this is uh, the level of the square wave and with shift it controls pulse width, that's a W there. If there's a menu, say for example, the menu menu, then you can dive into a parameter to edit it by hitting enter, then go back by hitting exit. If a parameter has a few options, say for example, for the envelope trigger, then you can edit it using either the value knob or by just hitting it a few times with shift. And when all else fails, there are additional options 
like I mentioned in the menu menu. It takes a while to get used to what each letter means here. Some are obvious, like in it. Some are maybe slightly less obvious. So in these cases, it would have been nice to have more segments and more characters on this display, but otherwise you get used to most of these pretty easily. In terms of build and connectivity, the enclosure is plastic, but everything feels solid and sturdy. You've got two octaves of keys or buttons really that aren't velocity sensitive. You've got stereo 3.5 millimeter audio output on the top panel alongside an analog mix pass-through input. So you don't need a mixer if you're chaining these or any other instruments to each other. Also on top are analog sync in or out for instruments that don't support MIDI. Then on the back are a USB type C port for MIDI in and out and audio as well as charging the S1. And then you've got 3.5 millimeter TRS MIDI inputs and outputs on this and all the other compacts. Any regular stereo or TRS cable will work well for chaining them, of course, for audio, but also for MIDI. If you want to connect them to bigger devices that have regular MIDI ports, you'll need one of these dongles sold separately. Okay, let's dive into the details and start with the oscillator section. And to make it interesting and to get two videos for the price of one, I'll go through these first by way of comparison to an original SH-101. And then later we'll look at all the additional sound design and sequencing features in here beyond the 101, like draw, multiply, chop, comb, riser, and so on. The oscillator section in both is actually a mixer that combines four audio sources in the basic SH-101 emulation mode. It's pulse, saw, sub oscillator and noise. Let's get right to the comparison. Sawtooth, nice and brassy on both. There's a four octave range knob here and a six octave range knob here, though this has a transpose as well. Anyway, this is as low as the octave and the range will go. Here it goes lower and I can even shift octaves further down so I can get pretty ridiculous. So if you want to close your eyes now, I'll press a few of these in different orders. See if you can tell the difference. Let's go all the way up the range. Try some higher notes. I think maybe just on that one note, I hear a bit of aliasing compared to this. Let's try the sub oscillator. There are three ranges on this, octave down, two octaves, and two octaves asymmetric. You change that over here, by the way, with shift. So one octave, two octaves, and two asymmetric. Let's try the high notes. And transpose all the way down. On the bass, close your eyes, see if you can tell the difference. Let's try the two octaves down. And this, close your eyes, I'll tap these randomly. And the asymmetric. It's got that nice little break in the waveform here on both of them. Sounds identical to me, you tell me. Let's try the noise generator. So again, I'll tap these randomly. This, by the way, has a selector. You can choose either white noise or pink noise. White is different than pink, and there's no white noise on the 101. Let's move on to the pulse wave. So first unmodulated. And let's listen to various pulse width on the SH-101. The S1 doesn't have a dedicated control, neither for pulse width nor for this source switch. You choose the source for modulating pulse width by holding shift and tapping the PWM source key. And then you play around with pulse width by holding shift and turning this knob. So minimal width, minimal width. Some difference here, maybe I'll open it up because I see it closed down a bit. I'll hold this. So this just closes down a bit more. 
when I open it up a bit, they sound pretty close, I think. And of course there's PWM on both. So the LFO rate gets its own dedicated knob, as it does here, dedicated fader anyway. The S1 LFO does have more shapes. LFO depth is that same shift function here. So I need to tune them to be more or less the same rate and depth. nice. Let's try this maybe a few octaves higher. Transpose this. Both, by the way, have a dedicated LFO mod control. So pitch modulation here. And here. Speaking of the LFO, the LFO has two ranges here. So it goes from as slow as this to as high as this on the low range. Then with shift, you move it to fast. It goes this high at the highest. The LFO here has just one range. So it doesn't seem to go as high, I think, as this. So we've covered the oscillator section. Let's take a listen to the filter section. I'll do this with a sawtooth waveform. Let's first start out with no resonance. And no resonance here. Let's see how cranking up resonance impacts the bass. You might want to protect your ears here. Let's set resonance to more reasonable levels, slightly more reasonable. So let's listen to a little sweep with this level of resonance. You can hear that crunchiness. Hey, it's me editing this video. Sorry for interrupting, but I got a copyright strike after uploading this. Apparently YouTube thinks filter sweeps are copyright infringement, but only if they're longer than 10 seconds. Let's crank up resonance all the way to hear that chirpiness. the same thing but I think they share that uh, lack of stability in between harmonics that crunchiness I think they did a really good job here let's talk about modulation there are dedicated envelope modulation and keyboard tracking controls here here you've got an LFO and envelope tracking knob like these two keyboard tracking is a shift function over here and then routing the envelope to the gate dedicated switch here and again a shift button over here both for the trigger that's this guy and for the amp so these two are shift functions here so ADSR controls here ADSR controls here so more or less Shooting lasers. That's your longer decay. And 
Let's try this in a slightly more musical context and to make sure they're both in sync, I can actually take the analog sync out from here and plug it into the external clock input in here. So let's get uh, maybe an arpeggiator pattern going here. And the same deal here. And maybe I'll just play with levels here. So just the S1. Just the uh, SH. Let's just listen to this for a bit. Let's try and do the same thing here. all the way. So I've got the S1 doing this, SH101 doing this. It's hard to match exactly. Yeah, I think uh, they sound pretty close. SH. S1. So I could go on and on, but I think you get the idea. They're very, very similar. Just a quick word about the bender section, portamento, the portamento mode switch, and these faders all exist here, but either with shift function combos or as parameters that you edit in the uh, in the menu. Okay, let's talk about draw and chop where S1's synth engine takes a more modern approach compared to the SH-101. Let's start with the draw oscillator. This replaces the square wave. So by default, square or pulse width wave does just that. But if we turn on draw, which we can do either by holding shift and draw to swap out the square wave, we need to go to shape and then hit enter, then choose either step or slope, there's a faster way to do this. No need to go into the menu, just hold shift and turn this knob and it goes from off to step to slope. The default draw waveform, by the way, in slope mode is a triangle. But of course, I'll hold this if I move it into step mode, then it turns into this and editing the 16 steps of the shape is pretty easy. Let's hold the note, go into draw menu and scoot over to a waveform and you can see by the um, the intensity of these LEDs sort of the triangle shape and to change any one of these just hold the step you want to change and edit it and you can see the change on the scope and hear it of course as well and this is in the um, step mode we can always go into Let's do it like this. Into slope mode to make things smoother. Keep editing the waveform this way. And that's our new waveform. So that's one cool feature of the draw oscillator. The second is its multiply option, which multiplies its frequency, but also applies a hard sync like reset to its phase. So this is better heard than talked about. Let's hold this again then I can do this in one of two ways, either go into the draw menu and choose multiply, choose that, and turn the value encoder, which is of course not nearly as fun as just holding shift and turning this knob, formerly pulse width, which now turns to multiply or basically hard sync. So that's a pretty nice and cool effect. The only problem with this is that you can't, at least as of the current firmware, apply the LFO or envelope to it. So you either turn the knob manually or you can motion sequence this parameter in the sequencer more on that later. Let's move on to the second oscillator wave shaping option and that's chop. Unlike draw, which replaces the pulse wave oscillator slot, chop is a function that you can apply to all four slots, including noise. Let's for example, take a look at this on the sawtooth waveform. 
So this is our nice basic saw. Like draw, we've got 16 chop steps. Let's maybe hold an oscillator, take a look at how this works. So the first thing we need to do is turn up the overtone or chop depth at the very least a bit. And we won't see it do anything unless we go ahead into um, actual chopping business itself. And we can choose to chop the square wave, the saw sub or noise. Let's go for saw. Then we've got 16 chop steps. So let's start making chops. Notice that little dent in the uh, sawtooth. If we go back to chop depth, which we can do either through the menu or holding shift and turning this, notice how that slice goes deeper into the sawtooth wave. It's basically attenuating it and eventually inverting it. Now we can introduce additional chop points or harmonics. And again, control the chop depth. And then chop has its counterpart parameter, which is comb, which multiplies the chops across the waveform. making the sound increasingly metallic. And here too, just like draws hard sync or multiplier, you can't, again, at least currently modulate neither overtone nor comb, at least currently, but you can sequence them in the sequencer. The next feature that's unique to S1 is the option to replace the noise generator with a riser slash downer. So this is our modified saw. Let's lower it for a bit and this is our noise generator, but the riser slash downer totally changes what this knob does. There are two ways to activate the riser slash downer, the hard way and the easy way. The hard way is to go into the menu and look for the riser function, which is this, but we don't want to do that. We want the easy way, which is just to hold shift and press these two buttons, enter and exit. Mode one called sync is a riser that's in sync with the tempo. And you just saw the second trait of riser. So basically it makes no sound either fully clockwise or fully counterclockwise. And the middle point is the middle between two riser options. So here, it's like a simple swoosh, call the downer here. On the left side of the dial, you've got the sync riser. So that's tempo synced. And then there are two other options, the non-tempo synced version, which basically increases the rate in the first half. And the uh, right half is a simple swoosh. And then the third riser option is the panner for the left part of the dial. So pretty obvious what this does. The right side is the same swoosh. And then if we go into the menus, we've got a few more riser parameters. So there's the resonance. And then the shape, which I guess applies only to there we go, this riser. Let's go back to shape. Yeah, that's shape. And then finally, the last option is level. Let's move on and listen to the effects. So we've got a nice reverb. And delay. And shift will change the delay times. And then you've got additional parameters, both for the delay and the reverb. If we hit shift and delay, we can choose, uh, say, to have the delay synced or not. So that's time and mix control. And then uh, level feedback. So 
So if we stop the pattern, it'll keep going. What else? Filtering. And that's it for the delay. And the reverb has a few types. So that was the spring. Doesn't sound like a spring to me. Sounds pretty nice. That's the uh, spring, modulated, ambient, room, hall, hall two, flight. Spring's nice in my book. Then there's time, which you can control with shift, level, pre-delay, and filtering, and the density as well. Then finally, you also have a hidden chorus in the menu. So this is our raw tone. If we go into the menu, choose chorus. You've got four options. So again, off. Nice stereo chorus. So those are the effects. Let's talk about the sequencer. This, as you may have heard, is a six step sequence. You can choose up to 64 steps in a sequence or fewer. So to live record, just hit play and record. There's a metronome if you want. And you can just uh, record anything. Let's say maybe go for polyphonic sequencing up to four note polyphony. You can also sequence up to eight parameters, eight motion sequencing lanes. So let's say this is filter motion. So just hit record. That's sequenced. I could also sequence, uh, yeah, let's say LFO depth. And like I mentioned, you can also sequence the uh, additional draw and chop features. So, so we've got this. So this is my um, hard sync. So I could sequence that. And if you hold the pattern button and turn a knob, you can see it's automation. There's no support for micro timing when you record notes. There is support for swing. We'll check that out in just a bit. Anyway, that's live recording. Let's take a look at step sequencing. There are actually three ways to step sequence. Either press step, press record when the playhead isn't running, or press step and record. So these three modes. Slight differences between each of them. Let's start maybe with a record mode. Here you move through the steps using this value encoder and just pick one or more notes per step. So let's maybe go for one, two, three. So that's our pattern. And we'll set the pattern to eight steps. Cool. So the nice thing about this mode is that I could go back to say this step and add another note here and add another note here another one here, and maybe this one here. Let's see what happens. I can turn off the metronome for this. Cool, so that's the pattern. Then step mode is one where you see the eight steps or 16 steps in your pattern, and you can go step by step and edit it by editing either the note. If you have more than one notes, then it's the first note and an offset, the velocity, the gate length, probability, and substeps. So substeps will add a one or more ratchet types. No ratchets. Two, three, four. And a few pattern options. You can sort of fake micro timing with one in the middle. Then probability is pretty straightforward. The chance that a note will trigger. 
then you can also set velocity, gait, a gait of 100 is a tie. Another way to create a tie is hold the note and press hold. And you can tie it as many steps as you like. And then the third step sequencing mode, when both step and record are on, is pretty cool. It lets you preview each of the steps, so you can no longer remove steps like you could in this step mode. So a quick press here in the normal step mode will remove steps. Here, it doesn't remove steps, but you can preview a step. And the nice thing about this mode is that it's very easy to automate parameters. So say open filter here, close here, open again here. Very easy to create automations this way. And you can kind of also use this as a performance mode. I could say, for example, say have a lot of reverb on this step, but none on these. or say a delay on this one. Right? So, no delay, say on this one. And delay on this one. Let's go back to eight steps on this and take a look at a few performance options once you have a sequence baked in. So transpose will let you transpose a sequence by holding shift. And if you don't hold shift, you can play on top of the pattern. And then there's step loop, will let you repeat certain steps in the pattern. So let's exit this, shift enter that. So repeat a step or repeat two steps. Then I promised I'd get back to shuffle. So um, I need to exit this, I guess. Shuffle. Which also goes into negative territory. So no micro timing, but shuffle is always cool. Then if I save this lovely pattern, then another cool feature is the reload function. So if I've messed things up, beyond recognition. Shift one and poly will reload the pattern. Let's move on and talk about the arpeggiator. You turn it on by pressing on. And just press um, a few notes. You can hold it and uh, choose from a few types. Up, down, up, down, two octaves, and a couple of random options. Then a few relative rate options. That's relevant if you've got another sequence for going in parallel. And you can swap chords in the arpeggiator, but you need to get the timing just right. Otherwise the clock will reset. So that is the arpeggiator. Let's talk about polyphony. You've got four voice polyphony. There are a few polyphony modes. Mono is just mono, so one note at a time, and there's legato and portamento. Unison is a unison mode. Just one setting for that. No detune or anything like that. And then the last option is chord mode. So this, as the name implies, plays a chord. Programming the chord is a bit difficult. Unfortunately, you can't just play a chord to program it. You need to go into chord mode. Then you've got a switch on off button for each of the th additional three voices and an offset. This is the offset for the second note. 
up to 12 semitones up and down. And same goes for the third note. And the fourth note. Oops. So that's chord mode. Finally, before the pros and cons, let's talk about S1's demotion feature. This uses a built-in motion sensor to modulate two destinations. So let's maybe hold this, press demotion, and you can see I'm modulating currently panning and level, but I could go ahead and hit shift in demotion and change the roll destination, say from pan to, um, a reverb level. See how that works. And let's edit the um, pitch. Here, pitch isn't pitch as in pitch bend, but rather the pitch of the instrument. And that can go to a number of destinations. Let's go for uh, pitch bend, maybe the obvious one. Or maybe um, let's try resonance or filter frequency. Resonance, not noticeable. Here we go. So that's demotion. Okay, let's take a look at pros and cons for S1. On the pros side, I think there's a lot to like here. Whether or not it sounds like the SH-101, and personally, I think it's very close. To me, that's secondary compared to the sheer number of extras in here beyond the SH. Polyphony, the effects, draw and chop. This, in my opinion, is a fun, excellent sounding synth with plenty of sound design controls in a very compact space at a relatively affordable price. Now, to be clear, I'm not denying the allure, mojo, and lovely form factor of the SH-101, and I admit there is something compelling about knowing that it's analog inside, but I guess you should ask yourself if you heard a difference in the segment where I compared the two, and if you did, if that difference is worth everything else you get in here, at the around $200 price point, instead of whatever the SH-101 will go for at the time you watch this. I was also fairly surprised at how well Roland incorporated all the hands-on controls of the SH-101 once you get used to the shift functions of the knobs and the buttons. I don't think this gets too menu divey. The functions that don't have a dedicated knob are typically a shift button or shift knob away. Unlike the J6, which is mainly a preset synth, here you're getting the entire boutique experience in a smaller box, arguably a better one at a much cheaper price. On the cons side, First, I have to admit that I had a hard time coming up with cons, not because it's flawless and don't worry, there's a whole list of wishlist features coming up. And of course, the S1 doesn't do everything, but at this price point, it does quite a lot and sounds pretty authentic to me. So in light of other portable synth alternatives at this price range, the S1 puts up a heck of a fight. So where could it do better? I think the fact that you can't modulate the draw and chop parameters here is a miss. I mean, this hard sync like or whatever it is. Multiply effect and chop and comb are just begging to be modulated with an LFO or envelope. Now you can automate their values in the sequencer, I showed you that earlier, but it can be a bit steppy and regardless doesn't compare to an envelope or LFO control. Then another thing that I think would help ease the learning curve is more characters and more than just seven segments per character, especially when you dive into the menus, it's not exactly clear what's going on in a few of these. Then regarding chord mode, it's great that it's there, but it should be possible, I think, to program a chord just by playing it as opposed to setting intervals in a menu. Then the next thing I wish they'd add here is the option to keep the same sound of preset as you swap patterns. You can do that for the reverb and delay effects. I think they should let you freeze the sound as well so you can program, say, a verse, chorus, and bridge, and then move between them manually or chain them. There's no song mode or pattern chaining option here, at least not in this version. Then finally, I mentioned this earlier as well, when the 
harp is in hold mode, I think it should sync as you play different chords. It's especially noticeable that it loses timing when you play with another instrument in sync between the two. So that's it for S1, quite a mighty and portable little synth. If you like the insights in this video, there are plenty more in my ever-expanding book of electronic music ideas, tips, and tricks available to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Hit like if this was useful, ring the YouTube bell below if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.